Great. All right. Um, so I got a couple of things to um, cover organizationally. So the first one is lecture attendance. Um, there's um, two ways we're going to track this. I tried to kind of find a, a golden way of doing this. That's the least amount of effort for um, the TA uh, because he's also a student. Um, so I want to kind of minimize the busy work for him um, and also busy, uh, minimize the busy work for you guys um, so that uh, this doesn't become just like another thing you have to do. So here's the plan that I came up with. Um, what you can do if you are attending a live lecture is to go to chat and just type present. We will um, scan that later on. I'm going to save those chats and we're going to scan them at the end of the semester to kind of check who was there and who wasn't. So, yep, thanks. Um, just type present and that's what we're going to look for. So I'm going to ask you guys, if you're in lecture, to just remember to do this. Um, I'll remind you a couple of times. Um, so that should be that should be it. Um, if for some reason you are not here or you forget to type in present, no big deal. Go to um, B2L and um, just click on the video link um, that I'm going to post in D2L for the lecture. So. I'm going to track who, I mean, the only thing I can track is basically who opened that link. So I'm going to assume that you watched it. Uh, if you're here, you can just click on it. If you're not here, uh, please watch the lecture. But I think that if I just ask you to open it within two days, at least like I will get you to the lecture and then hopefully you end up watching it. So setting just a kind of a small bar for um, you guys to get to get your attendance in to, to watch the material. And that's going to help you succeed in the course. Um, any comments on, on that approach? Anybody has anything to say? Scanning the chat, scanning the chat. Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. All right. <laughs> issue number two. Um, actually, not an issue, but just an update. So there was a question of what is the initial uh, slow start threshold set to in a TCP connection. I did some digging. Um, it's general not, generally not specified by the standard what it should be set to, so it can vary by TCP um, implementation. But you want to set it to a large to a large value. So I've I've seen some stuff where that that slow start threshold is set to the maximum possible window size you can you can set it to, and then it basically kind of gets set to whatever it needs to be um, after the first slow start phase. So. Um, if this makes sense to you, great. If not, then uh, you can kind of rewatch that. Um, just go back to the slow start threshold stuff and just remember that initially it gets set to something very large, and then you'll see how it very quickly gets set to something that's appropriate for a given connection. Um, all right, that I think um, covers everything that's kind of administrative or um, overdue um, that I need to get back to you guys. Next, are there any questions about the programming assignment that you want to discuss? Does anyone have anything? I have a question. Sure. Go ahead, Joe. Um, so, like, I got the functions and working. Um, you know, when one, um, one is a client and one is a server. Uh huh. I kept running into this issue, and I think I may have resolved it. I don't know. I'm still working on it. Okay. But but basically, tell us more. <laughs> sure. Um. Basically, they, they have to switch between being the sender and the receiver. And so I kept running into this issue where the client first starts out as the sender. And the server starts out as the receiver. Uh -huh. And so the sender will send its message. The receiver will receive it and then try to send an act back, or it will send the act for that. But then it will, you know, since it's got a message and it sent its act, it will switch into like the send mode because it has to process and then send a message. Um, but what happened is the client while waiting for the ACK, 
um, that at got corrupted. And so the client's still sitting there in send mode and it's like, well, I got a corrupted thing. So it just sends its message in. But then the server had then switched into like being a sender. And so then in its send mode, it's like, well, I just got this random message. Like it doesn't mean anything. I need an act too. Okay. And so they both yeah. like, by sending back and forth, back and forth, both waiting for acts, but both just, just getting like a random message. It's so, right. I mean, I've, how did you resolve it? So that's a good, that's a very good problem that I'm sure everyone is going to run into. Yeah. Um, so how did you make the leap to what the solution should be? Um, a lot of drawings. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, eventually, so like if, it, if somebody's in like a send in the sending mode and it mm -hmm. receives a message that is the message for its previous ACK, then it basically knows that the ACK wasn't received. And so then it will send the ACK, but then also send the same message again, like a duplicate message. So it basically kind of like goes, it sends both. So it sends its previous act and then it also sends its message. And so then okay. the other one who's also in send mode, but is mm -hmm. like needs to get an act will then eventually see that act. And then the incoming message that it doesn't know what to do with, it'll just be like, well, this is just, you know, nonsense and it will well, so it checks, it's like, is this a message from my previous act? If it's not, then it just kind of throws it away and then uh, goes into its receive mode. So, I mean, what ends up happening is you have this like bunch of extra messages kind of floating and pinging back and forth, but apparently, I don't know, it eventually resolves itself <laughs> is what I figured out. But right. it sounds, like like, really... sounds like you're getting close. That's not quite the, the easiest way of doing this. Um, well, yeah, okay. So I was kind of wondering if you could give some advice or like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Happy to. Um, does anyone have a good solution to this problem or has faced this problem? <laughs> cool. All right. You guys are in luck because you'll, you'll get this from the horse's mouth. Um, so what you need to do is both the client and the server need to implement both of both the sender and the receiver finite state machines. Okay, so the send function implements the sender state machine and the receive function implements the receive state machine. And they both need to have it. So they kind of they can run independently. So you don't need to like have a what the sender the sender doesn't need to go into receive mode. The sender just keeps executing the um the sender finite state machine and so then... be reading off of different buffers then mm -hmm. Uh... Mm -hmm. well okay so so like in the art in the reliable one or the 1.0 that you gave us they, they they read off the same buffer but you're saying you essentially have like two threads reading off two buffers. That you don't need, yeah, like you don't need threads in there. You can just keep calling uh, send and receive. Right? And whenever you're in send, you're in this, you're in the, um, I don't know, I guess maybe you do need threads in there. Mm. Well, I mean, you need something to coordinate any incoming message to then push to the correct or you have different. You don't need, yeah, okay. You don't need, you technically don't need threads because it's a request reply. It's a, a stop and wait protocol. So let okay. me, let me explain this. The send doesn't need to return until it gets the act. Yeah. But the send or the receive returns as soon as it sends the act. Yes, but but receive can be called again if it doesn't actually return a packet. Okay. I'll just think about this soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's the hint. Um happy to talk about it in, in office hours in detail. because uh, okay. you know you guys you guys will all need some time to go back and look at it. Um, but 
that's that's the idea. So you have like one finite state machine and send one finite state machine and receive, and they can uh, the send can block basically until it gets the act. Okay, thanks. Cool. Any other questions? All right, great. Let's do some material. Um, and then today is kind of a cool one. So let me share my screen with you. Okay. Um, can you guys see full screen? Could someone chat me real quick? Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. All right. So moving on to chapter four, um, I have also marked the sections in the, I started marking the sections on the uh, course schedule that, that these correspond to. So um, should be pretty easy to find the uh, relevant reading. All right. We're getting into data forwarding methods, which is chapter four, which is network layer, which is kind of a lot of networking. We'll spend a lot of time in this, in this chapter. Um, so, okay. So the network layer functionality is different from this end-to-end -end functionality of the application layer and the transport layer, which we've been uh, discussing. Where's my pen? Perfect. Okay. So the application obviously runs on end-to-end -end basis on the um, on the end hosts, as does the transport layer implemented by your operating system. But the network layer actually does the job of forwarding data along the different routers through some path from the source to the destination. So this is where a lot of the networking starts happening um, other than kind of the services provided by the transport layer. All right, and the network layer provides you with a lot of functionality such as addressing. How do you uniquely identify hosts and hosts within a network? Okay, uh, uniquely or I guess uniquely enough. Right, so that the network knows to send your packets here and not there. Okay, how to do connection setup between routers? When you connect things through a wire, how does one router become a part of the network in a way that is usable by another router? Okay. How do you do routing? What is the best path um, from a source to a destination? How would you even define best? Right. It's not always clear or maybe let's say there are multiple options, multiple metrics you can use to define best. Okay. And then finally, um, the network layer also does the job of forwarding your packet on one link versus another, which is what we'll talk about today. Okay. So now the logic of, this, of these protocols will be on every node, not just on end-to-end -end basis. And so when we go into the programming assignment on this topic, you guys will be implementing stuff kind of along the way, on, on the nodes along the uh, way as well, okay? Um, and then the forwarding decisions are based on packet headers um, and routing tables. So now there is also some state being man maintained in the network, and we want to be able to make decisions of where to send packets in, in the network without taking uh, too much time, without doing too much work, or without saving too much space on these routers because they need to get to everywhere on the internet without knowing everything about the internet. And so how can we do that? All right. Um, but this can also lead to some problems. Uh, for example, under certain circumstances, packets can be uh, forwarded in such a way that they arrive out of order at the receiver, which is then when the transport layer comes in and reorders your packets um, back to the correct order so that bytes are delivered in the correct order um, to the application. Okay, so what are some ways in which, uh, some reasons why packets could arrive out of order at the receiver? What do you guys think? If there's so, in the chat, yeah, go ahead, Justin. Or if whoever. they're sent over parallel links and one slower than the other, um, okay. you might receive it, like some of the data out of order. Yeah, it's possible. Um, there are some protocols that forward over multiple links. Uh, multiple paths. Uh, what is what also happens is that we are forwarding data over one path and then we switch onto another path that is maybe faster became available, right? And then you can have this like sort of a, a momentary momentary reorder event. 
Okay, what else can happen? The network can lose your packet, which will then result in a retransmission. All right, that's an easy one. Okay. So, would the, would the network lose your packet during like um like if the buffer's full or if there's uh, some sort of clogging or something like that and it drops a packet? Basically. Okay. Or due to interference on a wireless link. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could also be due to a bit flip because of a cosmic ray in memory. That can also happen. So the yeah. Packet, the packet does arrive, but it arrives um um basically doesn't pass the checksum now interestingly enough there has been work on memory that is self-correcting for the specific reason but that's more at servers than at routers so there are some ways of dealing with that as well and we'll get into kind of what can happen at the at the link layer to avoid this this issue and how to kind of recover some errors in packets because they do happen periodically Okay, so I've shown you guys this slide before. If you remember this, there's basically two kind of methods of getting data in a network on end-to-end -end basis. One is the store and forward technique where you take a stream of data, you divide it into packets, and then you forward that packet to a, on a link, and there are multiple packets arriving, and they kind of get intermixed in, um, in buffers. Okay, um, so that's packet, packet switching or basically what internet runs on. You also have circuit switching where you can establish um, a, an end-to-end -end circuit. Um, the resources on the circuit are reserved either through a time division multiple access or frequency division multiple access. Um, there are kind of other division, spectrum division methods, but they basically end up mixing um, either space and time. So you can think of instead of allocating these vertical bars and horizontal bars, you're basically allocating your transmission in little squares where you say, I'm going to send something on this frequency at this time and something else on another frequency at that time. Um, and you can also do code, div code division multiple access, which we'll talk about later as well. But um, an easy kind of analogy of that would be if you hear two people speaking at the same time, you can still pick out one person. You can kind of tune into that. And that's what a network can do that has been used in a, a cellular network in the past. It's kind of coming back in some sense. Um, but for wired networks, it's basically TDM or, TDMA or FDMA. Okay, so when we talk about datagram networks or forwarding packets, um, we want to set it up in a way that the network layer is, is a connectionless service, meaning that um, the router does not maintain per flow state. Um, there is no end-to-end -end connection being set up that corresponds to a flow going through a network. Um, um, you can, um, so there's, sorry, I was looking at a chat, got distracted for a second. Um, so there's no call, there's no call setup. We're not establishing end-to-end -end resources. Um, the routers don't in fact really know where the end host may be, it only should know kind of what to do with any given packet, because that's the only action it needs to take. If it has enough information to, to take a forwarding action, that's really um, all that we require of it. And hopefully the aggregate of forwarding actions uh, taken along a path, deliver a packet along that path, okay? And so the way this forwarding happens is um, you, the router gets a packet, um, on an incoming link, and it basically looks at its um, destination IP address and says, okay, well, if it's in this range, we're going to forward it out interface one. If it's in that range, we'll forward it out interface two, or if it's that, that range, we'll go out interface one. Okay? So the router basically takes a dumb decision based on what this table says and just forwards it left or right. Okay? The routing algorithms, which we'll talk about um, if maybe in the next lecture, actually end up building that table using network gathered about uh, the, using knowledge gathered about the network. But once the information is gathered, it gets reduced to this forwarding table, which allows dumb actions to be taken. Okay. Um, questions? No questions. Okay, just want to take a pause. All right. Um, the alternative is to set up what are called virtual circuit networks. Um, and I mentioned that we don't really have um, kind of these, these circuit networks being set up because 
packet-based forwarding is so much uh, more efficient at intermixing traffic. You don't end up with all kinds of reserved resources that are not used. But what we still do end up doing, and we'll come back to that in later chapters, is setting up these virtual circuits where um, you're still reserving, you still can reserve resources on end-to-end -end basis, but the transmissions are actually still done through, through IP packets. Um, but to make this reservation, either a, a, a normal circuit, like a phone circuit or a virtual circuit to do something like MPLS, um, still requires call setup. You still need to allocate some resources at, at every router. Okay? Um, and so every router ends up maintaining some state about a particular flow or about a particular circuit, which often corresponds to, to a single flow. So what we have on these routers is um, not an IP forwarding table, okay, but a virtual circuit identifier. And for that virtual circuit, we're going forward out into phase one. So if you're getting a packet that says, this packet belongs to virtual circuit 22, the router says, great, you go out into phase one. Okay? But then for each virtual circuit, uh, you need to have a separate space in that table, or, or basically need to go through, this, through the process of setting up this table before a, 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 a flow can even start um, going through this network. The advantage of, of this approach is that these virtual identifiers can be much shorter than IP addresses. You don't need to pass as much information in each packet. In an IP packet, we'll talk about it later, you have your um, um, you have your source IP address, your destination IP address, a bunch of other stuff. Whereas in a virtual circuit packet, you just have one thing that's just a virtual circuit identifier. It's very easy to find, it's very short to find, and so that can make forwarding much faster in hardware. Okay. So um, you can think about another problem that could arise in virtual circuit networks, which is, are these numbers unique in the whole network? Right? Can we run all of internet on one virtual circuit? Right? or on, on just some finite set of these virtual circuits. Right? That seems kind of preposterous, to say the least. So what happens, in fact, is that these virtual circuits can switch at each hop. Okay? So, for example, if we have a packet coming in on interface one, and it is identified by virtual uh, circuit ID six, we're going to take the packet, we're going to rewrite its virtual circuit ID to 22, and then forward it out interface one. So the virtual circuit number can switch at, at each router. Right? This, the row in this table is again set up during virtual circuit kind of set up and negotiation, but you can basically differentiate flows based on where they're coming in and the virtual circuit ID. Uh, so there's not like one virtual circuit ID per entire, uh, per all of the network. You basically just need to make sure that all the packets coming in on a particular interface don't have the same virtual circuit ID. And it's the only negotiation you need to do. You don't need to do this kind of internet-wise. All right. Um, I got the animations a little out of order. That's okay. So we kind of talked about the advantages of virtual circuit routing, which is smaller headers and faster forwarding, faster on per packet actions. Um, but there is a disadvantage that you do need to set up per flow state or per virtual circuit state at each router, and there is this connection setup that you need to do ahead of time. And so in practice, forwarding in the internet is based on IP addresses that has been determined to be the more scalable approach, but the kind of utility of being able to set up a virtual circuit and guarantee some resources are done is done at a higher layer through MPLS, or sometimes those things are mixed in provider networks. Um, but there's still kind of virtual resources being re being reserved, not physical links being kind of reserved whole for a particular flow. Um, all right, questions? Yeah, is there a significant uh performance loss when it has to each single, every single time change that uh, VCID, or is that pretty minimal? It's pretty minimal. This can happen pretty fast. Um, we'll look into how a router works in a second, um, but yeah, that takes, that takes very little time. What basically happens is you, you, you get a packet with this virtual circuit ID, 
and the router will extract the data portion and kind of copy it over or, or pipe it over to the output buffer, which is already has a kind of a header set up with the outgoing virtual circuit ID. Um, is this, are these tables using the ARP protocol? Um, no, they're gonna be using a, a routing protocol, but we will talk about ARP pretty soon. Good question, guys. ARP, think of ARP, just to skip ahead if you're curious. If you guys remember what DNS does for uh, kind of mapping between web addresses and IP addresses, okay? ARP is basically mapping between IP addresses and MAC addresses. So it's a very kind of analogous protocol. It works differently, but it's pretty analogous in terms of its functionality, uh, in terms of mapping uh, between one type of address and another across a layer. All right, great. Looks like the time. Okay, we're doing fine. Okay, so, um, Another thing to consider is um, what type of service you can guarantee in each type of network, all right? So if you look at the network architecture of the internet, which is packet-based forwarding, um, you can think of this service model as basically best effort. And best effort means um, nothing at all. It means I'll give it a good old college try kind of thing, right? So there is no guarantee on the minimal bandwidth you're gonna get on a flow. There is no guarantee about loss. Packets can get lost in a network. There is no guarantee on order. We talked about how packets can get reordered. There is no guarantee on timing. Um, your packets can be delayed really very long. I mean, there's packets, it's possible to get a packet that you send like two days later when it's getting bounced around the internet. I mean, it's rare, but weird things like that do happen, right? Um, and there's actually not even any congestion feedback, right? It, is inferred from loss mostly, right? When you lose a packet, TCP says, oh, looks like there might be congestion in the network. I better send a little less data, okay? So if you think of like, you know, if you think of the internet as like, you know, you want a Ferrari, you're really getting like a Ford Pinto here, right? This thing doesn't, doesn't give you anything that you can rely on, okay? So you can say, well, wh why did we build the internet this way? There must be a better way. We can do a better job, right? Well, turns out this kind of has been tried and it failed, right? Which is why we're talking about it. So you guys don't go down that path or you guys don't go down that path without knowing the pitfalls. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Um, so it was called asynchronous transfer mode networks. And this was like when the internet was starting, people were like, yeah, yeah, but you know, it doesn't give any guarantees. So all the phone people were like, well, the phone is dying. We need to bring the phone to the 21st century. And so they came up with this, um, these ATM networks. And inside ATM, they had these different services that could be provided. So you have constant bit rate, um, which was basically designed to carry voice traffic that had, that required just constant bit rate, 56 kilobits per second, right? So the bandwidth guarantee was on the exact rate that was needed. Um, there was guarantee that there would be no loss, there was guarantee on order, and there was guarantee on timing, so that the packets would not be at, you know, unduly delayed in the network, right? And so this was kind of like the highest, the highest throughput service um, sorry, the highest kind of reliability service with pretty low throughput, right? Because voice just doesn't need that much. Okay, so it was constant bit rate. And then they said, well, we're gonna do this available bit rate, which is um, basically you get some guaranteed minimum on throughput. If you wanna transfer a file or something like that, at least you can transfer the file, you know, with some kind of guaranteed bound on its delay, okay? No protection from loss because we can retransmit with things like TCP, but, Maybe we don't need to use full TCP. Maybe there's some guarantee on order, so we don't have as many retransmissions. Okay, no guarantee on timing, but now we can manage congestion right in the network where the network can tell a transfer protocol how to, you know, appropriately adjust its rate um, above the what is what is the guaranteed minimum. Okay, and then you have like unknown bit rate, which was another service which had a whole bunch of you know different types of things, but not the guaranteed minimum. Okay. And it turned out that even though this was kind of nice from an application perspective and, and um, something that could be useful, right? You can have this real-time traffic flow, for example, for voice, so this could be great for gaming. This just didn't perform very well. Um, it took too long to set up these calls. The signaling was complicated. The hardware, the, the uh, network hardware, the routers were expensive. Um, it just didn't work very well. Uh, com 
in terms of performance and cost when compared to packet forwarding internet Cisco routers. Um, and so ATM basically went nowhere. And, you know, Cisco and uh, Norton um, won the, the router wars and basically built internet. Okay. Um, but, but, this, the, some of the ideas of ATM, or at least ideas of different types of services, are actually coming back. There was kind of some resurgence in, oh, like early 2000s, like 2005, 2006, when people were talking about building some of this back into Wi-Fi networks. And then there just wasn't enough bandwidth, so it didn't matter. Um, but it actually did make a pretty strong comeback in 5G networks. There are these different classes of service. There are classes of service for IoT. There are classes of service for streaming. There are classes of service for uh, real-time uh, devices like autonomous cars. So um, there is a lot more signaling. It is more complicated, but it does guarantee you guaranteed uh, performance, but it only does it on kind of one link, on the link between your device and the tower. So that's where it's kind of manageable. It's not on end-to-end -end basis as it was the case with ATM. And what? so that's only for 5G, or do they implement that in 4G or anything else at the moment? Um, this, this is new in 5G. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, it's actually pretty cool. So when we yeah. go to 5G, there's like theoretically, you can get something like five millisecond delay to a tower, um, which is under the threshold for cyber sickness. So the network is no longer the bottleneck to running like virtual reality on a server. Interesting. You might be able to, you know, get like your Neuralink implant or uh, maybe some like cool glasses or contact lenses and basically not have to have a computer on your body attached to them. Is that similar to what Elon Musk is working with? Uh, working yeah, with? Neuralink is, is, yeah. is Elon's thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. I mean, his thing is self-contained, but I think that... Um, it's a similar idea in a way. It's an idea. So that, so Elon Musk is solving the problem of data interface to the brain. Um, if solved sufficiently, um, I think we can have kind of like VR in the brain, basically, or other cool stuff that we don't really know how to describe yet. Um, the problem is where do you run the computation for it? And, right. and ideally, it would be not, actually not ideally. There's some applications where it makes sense to have it on your body, there's some applications where it makes sense to have it in the network. And as always, we'll need both and let the market decide which one is more successful. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Good questions. Anybody else? All right, moving on. I'm just doing good. Okay, so um, we have ATM, which evolved from telephony, Talked about it, talked about it. Ah, and it was designed for dumb end systems, right? So telephones, um, just really simple stuff at the edge, and the complexity was inside the network. This was kind of the, 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 the bad approach, right? The better approach was to push the complexity to the edge where they have computers and they can run more complicated protocols and keep the internet core simple so it can be performant. Right? Things that are simple are fast. Um, but now when we enter networks or kind of applications where we don't want to have a lot of complexity at the edge. We don't want to have a, a big computer implanted in our brain or be wearing, you know, carrying like a brick around, which is kind of as barbaric to me as like those suitcase uh, laptops at first when they first came out, right? Eventually all that will be gone. Then the end devices will again become dumb, right? Or as cheap, as light as possible. And we'll be moving a little bit closer to something that looks like ATM, right? I think. So anyway, both kind of things can emerge back at certain times in, in certain forms. All right, so um, the last thing I wanna talk about is how a router is built inside at a high level, right? Just what the functionality is, which will kind of inform um, the types of protocols that can be executed or the types of moves that, that you can make. So what we have is um, kind of a picture of a router. We have a routing processor that is attached in some way to a high-speed fabric, which then connects the different inputs and output ports. What a router looks like, if you haven't seen one, it's, it basically looks like a blade computer that you put into, a, into like a, a rack with just a gajillion ports on it. 
And by gajillion, I mean anywhere from like eight to 64, <laughs> right? So um, just looks like a giant uh, network card, basically. Okay, so what we have is the input ports and output ports. Um, and inside the input port, we have a little bit of physical layer that kind of actuates how the bits are coming in. We have the link layer, which we didn't talk about yet. And then we have a queue of uh, packets that are waiting to be switched through this switching fabric to on an output port where they also go into a queue and then out on to via network card onto the wire. Um, we have this separation between the routing management or the control plane and the forwarding or data plane. Okay? So the routing processor, the control plane runs the routing protocol, kind of network management things. Um, and from that come out the routing tables, which are then installed, or the forwarding tables rather, are installed into the input ports. Okay? And the input ports just do the forwarding. They can be installed, kind of flashed onto hardware. So the switching, the taking decision of I have a packet, does it go out, you know, this port or that port can actually be done in hardware at line speeds. Okay. And the only thing that gets decided there is basically much match plus action. Does it match this row, that row, or that row? And then the action is forwarding a packet to an appropriate outgoing link, which really means into a queue of an appropriate output port. OK. So if we look deeper into the input port, we have the physical layer, which is line termination. We'll end up talking about physical layer a little bit. We have the link layer, which would be something like Ethernet. We'll get to that eventually. And then we have um, this forwarding queue, okay, which, um, given a datagram destination, decides what output port needs to go to. And then it sends that data into the switching fabric, which then forwards it to the appropriate output port. Okay, we want this to be very fast. Um, and if the packets are coming in faster, then they can be switched through a fabric. If the fabric is busy, then you end up with some buildup of a queue here and potentially lost packets. Okay, so that's one place where packets can be lost if the switching fabric is not fast enough to offload this data of an incoming uh, port of an input port. On the other side of the switching fabric, you have the output ports. Okay? So packets are coming out of the switching fabric and being put onto uh, into this buffer, which then goes to the link layer and the line termination. If packets are coming out of the switch fabric into uh, this buffer more quickly than they can be sent out, this buffer will grow. And again, packets could be lost. Right? So packets could be lost at either input ports or output ports. Um, all right, talked about that. Oh, so a good question is how much buffer space should a router have? Okay, we can think of that. Well, why do I care about it? Right, this is hardware, this is done already. I don't have any control over it. True, but if you are building a distributed application where you are forwarding data between multiple processes um, or between distributed computers, and now you are effectively running something like a routing protocol. Um, between different servers in your application layer, knowing how much buffer space you have is important. And you know, one you can say, "Well, I'm just going to use all the memory I got." Well, that could maybe not be the best decision. Even if you have the memory, it could still be a bad decision because that means you're going to have very, very long packet delays, right? As the packet makes it through to the front of the buffer. So, knowing a little bit about this makes some sense. So. Turns out that you can think of the, the right amount of bandwidth, the right amount of buffer for a link as the round trip time in a network, right? So that's also network dependent times link capacity. Okay, why is that? Well, if you think of like a TCP connection, right? It's basically going to try to send data all the time back to back through pipelining. Okay, so that's basically your link capacity, how much data you can push onto wire and then that data kind of flows through a network until it's acknowledged, right? So the round trip time is going to then uh, kind of allow the next batch of data to be sent, right? So sort of the max amount of data that you have to buffer before it's acknowledged is kind of related to um, your link capacity times round trip time. Okay? Turns out you can kind of get away with uh, 
in a sort of a larger network with round trip time, time between capacity divided by the square root of the number of flows. And right? these are kind of just ballparks, but you know, if you're setting up a queuing thing in your own distributed system, recall this and you'll be you'll be thankful. Um, so then once packets are in this queue, there could also be a question of which packets get forwarded first. Right? You could you could always forward on a first comes first serve basis. Right? That's kind of probably what all of us are assuming here. But you can also do other things like weighted for queuing, where you have a number of priority classes and you forward high priority packets first. That can also be reasonable. Um, or you can have other quality of service mechanisms, which we'll get to. Um, and then you're going to see a trade-off between, well, how much complexity does this, does this mechanism have versus how effective it is. Um, in the internet, the decision has been made to basically not have any quality of service, just forward all the packets. And the idea is that, well, if we can make hardware fast, we really don't need to do prioritization, right? It's like if you have a 20-lane highway, everyone can find some space, right? You don't really need to have like a dedicated lane for an ambulance. Um, but there are some places where quality of service mechanisms are useful, and we'll kind of talk about those later when we talk about multimedia. Um, all right, the last thing I want to talk about, say about these queues is that um, there have been proposals to kind of use, use the queue information to provide some congestion feedback. Okay? This is called active queue management um, in general. And random early detection is a pretty simple mechanism um, that can provide some feedback. Okay. So what the router can do is basically look at this queue length versus um, uh, versus a threshold. Okay. So if the queue length is under a minimum threshold, one value, right? So this queue is pretty short. We're going to take an incoming packet, packet coming off a of fabric, and we're going to enqueue it for forwarding. Okay. If this queue length has grown long and it is over longer than a maximum threshold, we're going to drop this packet always. Okay? So now that's going to be interpreted by the transport layer as a loss. But if the coolant is somewhere between the min threshold and the max threshold, okay, the closer it is to the max threshold, we're going to drop the packet with a higher probability. All right? So as we're getting close, as the coolant gets longer, there's a greater and greater likelihood of dropping a packet. Okay. Why would that be a useful thing to do at a router based on what you guys know about TCP? So maybe let's start there. What happens when a router drops a packet uh, proactively? What happens to a TCP flow? When a router drops, what I miss part of that. Oh yeah, sorry. When so if a router decides to drop a packet along an end-to-end -end connection, what will happen to the TCP flow to which this packet belongs? Will it receive um, like a not necessarily a timeout, but like a a triple ACK? Packet back. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It will. It will. If there's more packets flowing, it will receive a triple act. If this was the last packet, I guess it would just receive a timeout. Right. Great. Okay. So, if we have multiple flows sharing this outgoing link, um, why would this mechanism be useful? Will the queue? Will the queue like allow a better congestion control? Yes. It will. Okay. Why is it better though? Can it tell? Can it tell when it's starting to get congested because you have like variables for a queue length? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's essentially the effect of it. So okay. let's say we have ten flows sharing this outgoing buffer, ten TCP flows, right? And they start filling up this outgoing buffer. Now the router decides to randomly drop one of the packets. 
the result of it is that for the flow for which for which that happened, that flow is going to uh, significantly reduce its sending rate. But the other flows will be unaffected. Okay. So if a congestion occurs and the flows basically fill up this whole buffer, now all the flows are losing packets. And now all the flows are reducing their sending rate. Okay. And now kind of the throughput on this router goes to close to zero. Then they all start sending data again. And then the buffer fills up, and then they all experience losses, and then they all reduce their sending rate. So you end up with this oscillation of like everyone's sending, yay, and then there's no capacity, oh, you know. And so to kind of, you know, smooth everybody out, the router says, okay, now you wait, and now you wait, and now you wait, right? And so individual flows end up kind of dipping their sending rate, and so um, they kind of avoid this kind of just. Mm, you know, everybody kind of collapsing all at once. And so it's a pretty simple mechanism, pretty clever. Um, sometimes it's turned on, sometimes it's not. Yeah, depends kind of on the network and the router. Yeah, question. Yeah, so when, say, something drops and you get that triple ACK, and since it knows what is going through the throughput, does that make the uh, retransmission time go up at all as well? That make question make sense? Does it make the retransmission time go up? So like like would it would it connect faster and resend those packets a little faster as opposed to have the oscillating uh, yes. example? That's a very good observation. That's very good. Yes. If you're dropping a single packet per flow, you're gonna go into fast retransmit on um, a lot of TCP implementations. Okay. Um, versus versus not. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Um, so you were saying, sorry, uh, good. I was just, I was wondering, so you are saying that basically it like picks what, one link to sacrifice basically, and then like, but then switches through them and just keeps doing that? No, 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 uh, close. It picks a random packet in the buffer. So a packet is coming in and if the queue is getting long, there's some probability of the packet being dropped. Okay, gotcha. The router doesn't know what flow this belongs to. It doesn't even know if it's a TCP packet. Um, but it just randomly penalizes one flow, basically. Yeah. Third question. Is there a, a way to make that non-random then? Would you be able to like selectively say like prioritize flows or is that like just too complicated and not really much gain to that? Um, yeah, you could you could decide to penalize a particular flow or kind of rotate this around. This would take a lot more work. And um, remember that we want these this forwarding to be very fast to be implemented in hardware. Right? If you have like thousands of flows going through this router, you don't want to really keep track of this outgoing port of all the flows and try to do some fair weighted queuing, weighted for queuing. Um, you could, probably not worth it. Right? Randomness probably does a good enough job of, of dealing with this. Okay, so the last thing to talk about is, uh, nope, well, okay, maybe, two minutes. Um, the last thing to talk about is switching fabrics, okay? So depending on the type of router you have, you're gonna have a different implementation of the switching fabric. The early routers basically use memory. So you have a bunch of network cards connected to a computer, you have an incoming packet, you put it in memory, and then some other network card kind of fetches it from memory. Uh, using early routers, very slow in practice, um, so kind of not used anymore. Next, we had buses where you have very fast forwarding, right? so memory is slow compared to a hardware bus. So very fast forwarding between uh, input ports and output ports, but kind of only one path. All right, so fast clock speeds on this bus, but only one flow at a time. And then people figure out, okay, well, we can actually use crossbars where I can forward one packet on this crossbar and another packet on this path, right? So there's some par parallelism in how quickly um, and how many packets you can forward to the switching fabric at a time, right? Just kind of a hardware um, improvement, okay? Um, 
course, as you go from left to right, you're going to end up with kind of higher hardware costs, higher implementation costs. And so because switching fabric is the best you can do, I mean, you can do like a multi-layer switching fabric, et cetera, et cetera. But there is some limit to the number of ports you can put on a router. 64, 128 is like the reasonable limit. Even kind of the, you know, the very large switches that are used in data centers will uh, cost you tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, so um, when you are, you could think, well, why don't we just build, you know, a giant data center instead of around one switch? Believe me, they would love to. They just can't afford it. Like, there's just no way to do it. So that's why even, even inside data centers, there are networks that connect um, different computers just because you can't find switches that big. Nor really would you want to, to be frank. Um, and we'll get to that when we talk about data center networks. All right, um, I'm going to end right here. I'm a minute over. I apologize. Uh, thank you for joining me in person. And um, if you haven't said present, please do so now. Um, and I will see you guys again on Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I assume we're saying present in the chat, correct? What's that? We're saying present in the chat. We're saying present in the chat. I'm going to save the chat files. Okay, great. And basically, we're going to go through them at the end of the semester and just scan okay. everybody. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Witte, do you have a couple minutes that we can talk about that programming assignment a little bit more so I can work on it between? Uh, sure. I mean, if you don't have time, let me stop. Let me stop recording. All right, I think I got everybody.